folks that haven't uh, logged in or are able to, to join us. So, um, so we'll get started. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, with our legislative work right now, I was just going to say at the Capitol, but um, we aren't uh, we aren't necessarily physically on the House floor, but we are still very very busy right now. So our um, constitutionally, we have to finish our work uh, during the regular legislative session has to be wrapped up by uh, May 18th this year. So we um, we're very busy as we normally would be. We're just um, you know working from our homes and sometimes from our offices in the state office building, but each of us in our separate offices um, on our own. Uh, we, we have a speaker who's been taking things very seriously. We did have um, some staff people uh, at the House of Representatives who did uh, have COVID-19 kind of early on in the pandemic. And so um, just making sure that we're keeping our, our staff and everybody else safe. So um, we've been doing a lot of committees via Zoom and also phone conference, and those are all recorded through the House um, Public Information website. And so those are available both uh, to watch streaming. There are lots of committees going on this week. I think the plan is that um, we, we will um, be having a lot of committees meeting this week and then kind of the final week of session. So starting next week, we will be um, virtually on the House floor and uh, debating and voting on bills uh, uh, remotely as we have been for the last uh, couple weeks now. So it's kind of a, a, a complicated process, but we've got we've got it down, I think, as, as well as we can uh, with figuring out the technology. Um, so this week, Uh, just yesterday, we passed a bill uh, to get the so the Help America Vote Act dollars. So there were some additional federal funds that were made available uh, due to so first there were some funds made available at the end of uh, 2019, and then just recently through the CARES Act. And so we needed to take legislative action to make sure that uh, the state of Minnesota has access to those dollars. And um, so the Help America Vote Act is, is what it sounds like. And so that'll go towards election security and um, making sure that uh, our Secretary of State and our counties who are running our elections have the resources they need to make sure we can do elections safely this year. Um, we were not, uh, so it, it, it was a compromise bill. And so uh, one provision we were not able to get um, in the final deal was automatic vote by mail, but we will still have our vote by mail options that we've had for a long time um, in, in Minnesota. And so those, those options will be available. We'll get those funds to the Secretary of State. And um, we also had to tweak a couple things uh, with allow, so normally what the counties have to tell us their polling locations. Uh, a year in advance. And so we we changed that so that the counties have some flexibility to change where their polling locations are going to be this year so they can choose to um, have our polling locations in places that are still going to be safe, even if we're still under social distancing and, uh, you know, COVID-19. <clears throat> Um, parameters. So we did, uh, like I said, that was a compromise bill with uh, lots of uh, both Republican and Democrat votes that passed the House yesterday. And uh, we, my understanding is that the Senate Senate will also um, pass that bill. So we're hoping to see that happen. Um, also yesterday, we passed a bill uh, to support hourly workers at schools. And um, so essentially the state we so obviously when we, uh, when we put out our budgets for the schools and, and the, the funds that were sent to the schools, the, the understanding was that we would all be in school and that the workers would be at school and be getting paid. And so this bill is just um, making clear, uh, among other things, like making clear that hourly workers should continue to get paid um, at least through the end of the school year. And then, um, you know, understanding that our budgets for our schools, like everything else, are going to be impacted uh, looking forward. But in, in the meantime, we wanted to make sure that those employees are still supported during this time. Uh, so that that did pass the House. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure yet when those will be scheduled uh, on the Senate side. But, uh, you know, we've, I think we were uh, in session for 
four or five hours yesterday. So, you know, we have figured out ways to still debate bills and, and be safe. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, another bill that passed the Senate uh, that we're expecting to vote on hopefully this week in the House was the ban on the TCE chemical. So if you remember, uh, the news has been an ongoing issue for over a year now with the, the Water Gremlin Company and they had um, been releasing this toxic chemical TCE into the air for um, over 15 years. And so the there was a compromise bill there as well, uh, thanks to some really hard work by some community advocates uh, in the White Bear Lake, Vatness Heights, Gem Lake area uh, to get that done. And so that passed the Senate and um, we're hoping to vote on it um, within the next week and uh, then it would be sent, sent to the governor. So that's all happening. Um, I'm working hard on the committees I'm on. I have a tax committee this week. We are hoping to have um, at least a, a basic tax bill um, to deal with some conformity issues at a minimum this year. Uh, and um, also working on uh, some environmental issues related to the LCCMR, which is the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So that's the um, percent of lottery dollars that goes towards uh, different kinds of science research and um, conservation projects. So uh, all things that we're working on, and I know um, we'll have other COVID-19 related bills that will be coming up uh, in the coming days as well. And um, we'll get to some questions a little later, uh, but first, um, this this for this week's uh, virtual town hall, I thought it was really important that we start to lift up some of the voices of the people who are working very hard right now and uh, serving our communities uh, on the front lines. And um, so I, a, a friend of mine is a nurse at a local hospital and uh, she was willing to speak with us kind of about her, uh, her experiences uh, working and uh, caring for, for patients who have COVID-19. And so um, Nicole, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, I will, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let you kind of introduce yourself. Um, and, and then I, I've got a couple questions for you. So uh, Anna, if you could mute Nicole, there we go. Hi everyone, I recognize some of you, um, and if not, it's nice to meet you all now. Um, so my name is Nicole. I um, went to school at the University of Minnesota to get my degree in nursing. Um, and I've worked at the Minneapolis VA ever since. And then, um, Sorry, <laughs> walk by me. And then I'm actually also a law student um, focusing on health law and health compliance at Mitchell Hamlin. So Nicole, and I know, um, you know, I know I, as, as a friend of mine, you know, we've had a lot of uh, personal conversations about what's going on, but if you could just talk a little bit about what a, a typical shift is like when you go into the hospital. Um, and maybe uh, comment a little bit on how it's different now um, compared to pre-COVID-19. Sure, so I um, work on a step-down ICU, and so basically that means I would usually have about three patients that I care for. Now, carrying on the COVID floor, I care for only about one or two. Um, it takes about double the staff um, to do everything that we would normally do um, to care for these COVID patients. So it starts out strange. So I don't go to work in my clothes like I normally would. So I go to work 15 minutes early to change on top of the 15 minutes I would normally arrive just to be a prudent um, employee. And then I also arrive an additional 15 minutes early um, so I can be briefed on whatever changes of the day there are. Um, because every single day we have new policy updates. It's changing constantly. Whatever you did the last shift is not what you did this shift. Um, so when I come in the door, um, I have to show my badge and it has a green sticker on it. And that means I'm allowed one shift, um, a one shift mask. And so that means I get a new um, paper surgical mask to wear for my entire tour. Um, other patients that are not carrying, or other employees that aren't in COVID units, where they're in cold units, they get one mask per week. And then, so I go upstairs to my unit with my one mask um, and I change into my stuff and then I get my face shield. So I get one face shield now for the rest of the pandemic. Um, at, we initially, we weren't sure about supply chain and whatnot, and so we were throwing them away, but now we're keeping them um, and that one's mine. 
um, and then I get my patient assignment like normal. So where it really starts to get weird is I meet my patients via video, um, just like we're talking now. So normally the first thing I would do would go in and meet my patients and talk to them and see what they need right away. Um, but now I am limited to only going in the room twice. So I have to wait. Um, typically I work evening shifts, so I do not see my patients physically until dinner, um, which is about two hours into my shift, um, which it, it already starts being frustrated, frustrating at that point because um, they haven't been seen since lunch typically. Um, so they're already frustrated, they're usually uncomfortable, and that's just not in our nature to be what feels like ignoring our patients. Um, so I gown up, um, when I do go see my patients, I have to be watched going in the room to make sure that I have all of my gear on correctly. Um, so there's a specific order that I put on my gown, my hairnet, my um, face shield mask, all of that, and it has to be watched. And so, um, and then someone signs off that I did it correctly. Um, so then when I do go and see my patients, I have to do everything as fast as I can. Normally, I would have the luxury of spending 45 minutes to an hour with my patients, getting everything set up for them, helping them with every little thing that they need. And now it's limited to just the most basic things that I can achieve on my own. And if I really need a second person, then someone else can come in there with me. Um, but mostly I have to do everything by myself without the help of a nursing assistant. Um, and then again, we repeat that routine at uh, bedtime when they get their medicines again, typically. So the rest of the communication that I uh, have with my patients is all um, via the call light or we can talk back and forth to each other or it's all via cameras um, and then monitoring of just their, their heart rate and their vital signs uh, through a different monitor that I have at my desk. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, th thank you uh, for sharing all that. I know it's kind of helpful to visualize, um, you know, what, what this is like. Um, could you talk a little bit more about sort of the, the challenges, you know, not just with equipment and sort of the um, practical challenges, but, um, you know, the challenges for you personally with, with doing things this way and, um, you know, the things that you notice that are different about your patients as well. Okay, so the biggest challenge, of course, is not being able to touch them. So COVID makes you extremely tired. Most of my patients are laying in bed. They don't walk around. They are literally so tired where they just sleep all day and they have no interactions. So even when the time that they are awake um, and want to communicate with people and want to be with people, I can't be in there with them. Um, and when I am in there with them, they're seeing me with a mask and a face shield. They don't see anything. And so it's just not in nurses' nature to not be able to connect with our patients like that. Um, and then when you are, a lot of our patients, um, part of their disease process is they're getting encephalopathy. And so they're confused um, and disoriented. And so you can't effectively communicate to them what is going on. So they're they're lonely and they need help and they call over and over and over again and want you to be in there with them and you just have to repeatedly tell them that you can't you can't be in there with them and that you are just this scary gowned um shielded person that's telling them that you can't help them um and like i said that's just not in our nature that's not how we care for patients and that's not how patients deserve to be cared for and we're just you know there's not really any other way um to be doing it yeah, thank you um, for sharing. I know this is um, it's it's hard stuff to talk about. I know um, my my mom is a nurse as well, and um, you know I'm sure those of you who have family members and friends who are nurses, you know that these are these are our people that were meant to take care of other people. Um, I know that's really just kind of the core of of what a nurse is and and who you are. Um, but I think it's really important that we that we hear about this and kind of think about those those elements to this disease as well. Um, what do you wish that 
other people, because I'm not going to keep you here too long, because I know other people have questions, and I also don't want to totally wear you out um, having to answer some of these tough questions, but um, what are some things that you wish other people uh, knew about COVID-19? Um, so my biggest thing about this is that when people are telling you, and they're using the numbers like, 99.9% .9 of the deaths are people in long-term care facilities and people with underlying health care conditions. And they're framing it in a way where it makes you feel like the general population is fine and that's not you. That is not true. Obesity counts as an underlying health condition. 30% of Minnesotans have obesity. Hypertension, so blood pressure over just 140, is an underlying healthcare condition. That's 24% of Minnesota's population. Overall, 3 million people in Minnesota have chronic healthcare conditions. That's a huge portion of our population. This isn't a small sect that are the ones that are dying or being hospitalized. They're not the people that you think of that are very, very sick, the people that have cancer or liver disease, the people that you think are just in care facilities. This is our population. Our population has chronic illness. That's the reality of America. And so this isn't just this little population that is getting sick and dying. It is your neighbors, your friends, your family members. It is all of us as Minnesotans. It applies to everyone. Thank you. Um, I think that is, uh, that's, that's really important to, to note. I know, um, you know, at first you think, uh, oh, I'm, I'm healthy. It's fine. And then, you, you know, when you do kind of dig into that a little bit further, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure like, you know, people with diabetes and people with, uh, you know, I have, I have a brother who has muscular dystrophy or um, family members who have survived cancer or any of those things. Um, I do think that's, that, that, uh, that's a really important thing to, to bring up. So thank you, Nicole. Um, and just, I, like I said, I won't keep you too long. And I, I do really want to thank you for being willing to be, um, really honest and, um, just upfront with us about what, what's happening. And I, I know I'm not the only one that's grateful for the work that you're doing. Um, and, um, I know, I know too, you know, I, I'm sure it's a little bit hard for um, the people in your family too. probably worry, worry about you a lot. Um, I know uh, as, as your friend, I worry about you too. So um, is there anything else that, that you want to share with us before we, we let you go and let you get back to your studying? I would just say, um, you know, we're all in this together. I'm frustrated um, and I know all of you are frustrated, but we just need to keep following the guidelines, washing our hands, social distancing, and we will, um, we will get through it. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. And um, if, if everyone else will join me in waving at Nicole to thank Nicole, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, it, it means a lot. So thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Have a good day. Um, so now, um, thank you all for, uh, for listening. I think it's really important. I think in, um, in my next town hall, I'm going to try to, uh, bring in, uh, an educator or a teacher to talk about, uh, some of what they're dealing with. You know, I've, I've shared with you some of the things about, um, from my end as a parent, but I think, you know, some of our other frontline folks, I'm, I'm hoping to in the future to possibly have, uh, uh, one of our, our local firefighters share with us um, how they're doing and what's going on too. Because I think um, the more we can lift up the folks that are really putting themselves at risk. I mean, I know it's hard for me that I, uh, you know, there are all these things that we wish we could be doing, like going out with our friends and getting our hair done and, you know, getting haircuts and, and all those things. But I think um, I, I do try to ground myself in the important work that, uh, you know, our delivery people, our nurses, our doctors, our law enforcement, all those folks are doing for us. So I'm going to continue to try to lift up some of those voices in uh, future town halls as well. Um, so now uh, we're gonna move on to a couple of questions. Um, I'm just gonna sort of go in order here. We had a couple emailed in as well. Um, so let's see, Scott. Um, Scott, uh, did you wanna ask your question directly, Scott? We can take you off mute. Okay. There you go. Go ahead. Uh a couple of weeks ago, I read that uh, Tesla was going to build a new 
plant somewhere in the United States to uh, produce vehicles. And so I had sent uh, Jamie a uh, email that uh, encouraging Minnesota to consider investment. And Tesla wants a lot of money to uh, invest here, but I think uh, Minnesota has maybe some of the raw materials and people to produce vehicles. And I guess I'd like to see us try for that. And we yeah. probably have our better financial condition than most other states. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so Scott's question was about, um, he had read that there was a, maybe a Tesla um, plant being that's going to be put somewhere that, you know, they're looking for a place. And I, I know I've talked to other, I've heard from other constituents as well, who are sort of encouraging us as we look at sort of rebuilding our economy and, and moving forward, um, you know, using this as an opportunity to move us forward when it comes to um, alternative energy and, you know, newer technology. And I do think that um, that's a great idea. I haven't, um, I, I asked around a little bit and nobody knew for sure. They didn't have any answers about, um, you know, who or, you know, a certain location in Minnesota. But I do think your point about, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing we should be encouraging um, right now. And, and that relates to another topic that I'm guessing will, uh, you know, someone usually asks and that that's about the bonding bill. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot sort of from day one about, uh, you know, looking back at other outbreaks of disease in our country's history and sort of how do you, how do you come back from these things that have economic consequences. And so I think um, looking at, uh, you know, things where we're making investments in financially prudent ways and the ways that we can, I think is incredibly important. And so part of that I think is going to be a bonding bill. Um, likely you've heard uh, in the news lately that the minority leader in the house has um, said that he's not, he, his members aren't gonna vote uh, for a bonding bill um, this year. I, I mean, that was a statement a couple of days ago, but I know when I've, I've been talking to folks in um, different parts of the state, I, I think that um, I think that's pretty short sighted uh, to sort of put the brakes on that um, right now. I think the sooner that we can start making those investments in our communities, the better. And we know that there's a need. Um, we sort of we, plus we have a good bond rating. And so if we are able to do that, I think, in a financially prudent way. Um, you know, and bonding bills also are, uh, are job creators. And that, that alone obviously is not a reason to spend that amount of money. But I think, um, you know, we've got roads and bridges investing in the University of Minnesota. You know, we've, we've got lots of good projects sort of statewide um, that would be worth, worth putting our investment into as a state. So I will be continuing to work hard to make sure um, to do all that I can to, to push a bonding bill forward this year. I think, um, it also relates to some other issues, uh, some other funding streams that we have available to us in Minnesota. And one of those I, I mentioned real quickly at the beginning is something that I've been working on, and that's uh, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, so those lottery dollars. Um, that bill is around $60 million, which, um, you know, in, uh, in an overall budget for the state is maybe not uh, the hugest number, but obviously that's uh, $60 million is uh, 275 full-time jobs, you know, plus all these other research projects that they're doing a lot of things through the U of, U of M, the DNR, um, lots of trails work, including with some outside organizations like Wilderness Inquiry and Outdoor Education and uh, STEM Learning and just like a lot of really good projects, um, conservation-minded projects and science focused projects, things involving uh, dealing with emerald ash borer, which is a big problem for our local cities, as well as aquatic invasive species. You know, there's just, there's all these things in that, that money is just sitting in the account. Uh, you know, the, it's already been paid into the account and it, it can be, um, it can be used. And so I think that as well as our, uh, our legacy dollars, so the Outdoor Heritage Fund, um, you know, we're supposed to get an update today on uh, those those financial numbers and we'll have a better idea of what, um, you know, a final bill can look like that would still be responsible. But um, I'll still be continuing to push that we get the Outdoor Heritage Fund bill done and other legacy things done because, uh, you know, we, we expect that our, uh, that the general fund is not going to be looking